I've reached a point where I plan to move the receiver from this location, which is actually a little shop I have in my garage, uh, and I'm going to move it inside. One reason that I like to start out here on something like this is there's a fair amount of cleanup that involves dust and uh, metal uh, contamination, rust, and uh, other things. In some receivers, even worse than that, but uh, I think uh, you get my point. And I like to do that out here where it doesn't contaminate my, uh, my inside shop. But I'm planning to move it inside partly because that's air conditioned and this isn't. Uh, also because I have better test equipment in there. But before I did that, I thought I might just wrap up two small things. One is I do plan to install a three-wire uh, grounded cord. And I do plan to install safety caps. And I thought for those of you that might not know what I was talking about in an earlier video, these are safety caps. You can find them at most uh, electronics distributors and radio restoration uh, companies that, that sell parts for radio restoration, places like Antiques Radio Supply and Just Radios and so on. Uh, what they are intended to do is if something happens to the capacitor, they fail in what I would say gracefully. In other words, they don't burn up, they don't explode and throw hot plastic all over everything. They just, they, they just open up. And those are relatively new uh, these days. A lot of fires were caused by capacitors that were connected across an AC line in equipment in the past, not just radios, but all kinds of, of commercial and industrial equipment, uh, consumer equipment, and so on. So today it's considered to be uh, a serious safety issue if you leave those capacitors in old equipment when you have an opportunity to replace them. So I'll do that. Do this, and then what I'm going to be doing is checking the functions of this receiver, and among the things I'm going to be testing is sensitivity and for that you need a fairly well calibrated RF source which I have in my uh, in my inside workshop so enough about all of this uh, next time you see this thing I hope it'll be inside and we'll be ready to to start testing the functions as we look at the functions of the SX 71 let's first kind of go over the front panel here is the main tuning dial, and that uh, is adjusted with this main tuning control. On the right is the band spread, and that's adjusted with the band spread control. And you normally, if you want, for example, you may or may not notice on this, there are uh, notations. For example, right here, there's a notation for the 80 meter band. You see it's written over there, and then it points up to this little dot right there. What that means is that you have to put the pointer of the band spread over at the 100 point and set the main tuning dial to that little dot. And then you can read off of the band spread dial the 80 meter band. So, uh, I'm sorry, I said 80, it should be 40 meter band which runs from a little below 7 megahertz up to a little above 7.3 megahertz. So <clears throat> that is the tuning. The CW pitch is the far left control and next to that is reception. Now reception, because this is an SX71, the X means that it has a crystal filter. The crystal filter can be put in a number of positions. The reception control starts uh, fully clockwise in the phono position. And there's a phono jack on the back that you can play a, a phonograph, for example, through the speaker of this uh, system and the amplifier. But normally you wouldn't want to do that. It's uh, not a real good uh, amplifier for that purpose. It was put on there mainly just add an extra function. Then you can go to the sharp position, and we'll look at this maybe a little later when we talk about the crystal filter in this and the alignment. There's a sharp, 
then a broad, and then a normal. Now, the difference is the sharp and broad are both crystal positions. So there's a sharp crystal and a broad crystal, but the broad crystal actually is still sharper in terms of its skirts than normal. Normal is for listening, for example, to uh, AEM uh, reception. Then there is a narrow band FM setting. Now, narrow band FM is not the same as the traditional FM. In other words, it's not the, the music that you hear between 88 and 108 megahertz. Narrow band FM is uh, a method that was used for a long, long time by public service agencies, police, fire, and so on, as well as by some amateurs. It generally was used in the upper ranges. This receiver will uh, cover from 5.5 up to 34 uh, megahertz. The, uh, it also has a 46 to 56 megahertz frequency range in position 5. In position 5, however, instead of using the main tuning dial, what you do is you use this tuning dial, 46 to about 56. This is the area that is, uh, it's called the 6 meter band by amateurs, and this is where you find, found most of the narrow band FM, and even today you can still find some amateurs operating narrow band FM on 6 meters. The, uh, so that's the reception control. Down here is the, uh, the BFO control off and on, Next to it is the noise limiter, which can be used to, what it does is it clips noise spikes. Uh, it sometimes can help. It's not a, a, nearly as effective as some modern uh, dynamic noise limiters, but it does help. Then uh, over here is the crystal phasing control. If you have the reception control in one of the crystal positions, like sharp or broad, then the phasing control, in essence, controls the, the, the point of minimum and the point of maximum response. I did a video on crystal filters a few months ago, I think, and you might want to look at that if you're not familiar with how crystal filters work and, and how you might use a phasing control. I'm not going to talk about that very much here. Then a tone control, which is the normal uh, you know, in one position you uh, you cut the bass, in the other position you cut the treble, and in the middle is generally the best uh, the best overall response. We've talked about band spread. On the right is the volume control, which is also the power off. That is, when you turn this on. It clicks and then it operates like most normal radios do. And then on the far right is the sensitivity control. The sensitivity control is essentially the uh, RF gain control. Down beneath this is the receive standby switch. And that was used so that if you operated this uh, receiver in a ham station with a transmitter, when you were transmitting, you would flip this to the to the standby position, and then when when you finished transmitting and you wanted to receive, you would flip it to the stand to the receive position. Now you also can use the standby switch to keep the tubes warm in the receiver, so that for example, if you're going to be gone for a while but you want to come back and and you want the receiver to remain as stable as possible, you might leave it turned on during that time, and then all you have to do is flip the receive switch and you have kind of an instant on capability. In the middle of the dial is the S meter or strength meter. It measures the strength of the signal and this particular receiver, if I remember right, you cannot turn off the automatic volume control. It operates all the time. So, uh, and that is 
uh, can affect the S meter readings, particularly when you adjust the sensitivity control. But if you leave sensitivity turned up all the way, which is the way most people use this receiver, the uh, the only time you might want to change that is if you are operating in, in uh, CW. This is not an especially good CW receiver, although it does have a really nice sharp crystal filter, but the receiver itself is not really optimized for CW. It's more for someone that wanted to listen to a combination of the ham bands and the international broadcast bands. So that is the front panel of the SX-71. Here is the schematic of the SX-71A. This is the one that I told you earlier in part one that I pasted together from printouts of the SAMS PhotoFact folder for this unit. This is a double conversion receiver. In other words, the starting on the left up here, there is an RF amplifier. Then there is a mixer which works with this oscillator. This is a 6C4 oscillator and we'll look at a little of this circuit detail a little later when we actually talk about the alignment. But this is the converter that you normally see in a superheterodyne. In other words, sometimes this is a pentagrid converter where the oscillator and mixer are all in one tube. For reasons of stability, the SX-71 separates the oscillator from the mixer. But the purpose of the oscillator and the mixer is to convert the RF frequency down to the first intermediate frequency. Then this receiver has a feature that was relatively unique for its day. It has a second converter. This tube, a 6BE6, converts the first IF frequency down to the second IF frequency. Now the first IF frequency is uh, 2.075 megacycles, I believe, if I remember right, and the second is 455 kilohertz or kilocycles, which is typical for the day. These are the IF transformers for the second IF. This is the IF transformer for the first IF. So it goes then through a first and second IF amplifier. Then this receiver is unique, uh, somewhat unique, because it has a third IF amplifier before the detector. The detector, let me zoom in a little bit on some of that so you can see it a little better. The detector is a 6AL5 uh, dual diode wh whose output is then fed to the audio stages. But before I go there I'll mention that there is an additional tube used for the beat frequency oscillator called the BFO that is up in this section. Now let's take a look at the audio stages the next tube in line is the automatic volume control uh, detector. Basically it develops a voltage proportional to the signal strength and feeds that back to the uh, IF stages to control the gain. And a uh, limiter, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, a limiter. The purpose of the limiter is to uh, restrict the, the AM that is the amplitude modulated signals. The audio is fed over to the AF amp, which is this tube, a 6SC7, and finally to the output, which is a 6K6 power output tube through the output transformer and connects to the speaker terminals or to the headphone if you if you have that. So the reason that I've gone over many of these circuits is so that you'll understand a little better when we start doing the functional analysis and also especially when we get to the alignment. Now I don't know whether this receiver will need alignment but I, what I will do is go through the alignment procedure and in places where it needs to be uh, touched up I will do that. I've been doing some performance testing on the SX-71. What I'm using is 
some material from a service bulletin that was published in 1950 that has to do with performance data for the uh, SX-71 and basically it says that the uh, 10 dB signal to noise ratio on the shortwave bands should be about 2 microvolts. So let me show you how I'm uh, setting up to measure that. By the way, I have checked the calibration of the receiver, that is the alignment, I should say, of the receiver. The IFs in this receiver are spot on, so I don't really want to mess with them. The reason is, in a crystal filter receiver, you don't tune the IFs to a particular generator frequency. You tune them to the exact crystal frequency that you have, and that will vary a little bit. In this particular case, the crystal frequency is almost a kilohertz, uh, or I'm sorry, a a tenth of a kilohertz below 455. It's about 454.8 or something like that. So I'm not going to bother uh, messing with the IFs. Instead what I've done is move to the performance testing because I want to see if there's any improvement that can be made before I try to do any alignment. So let me show you how I'm doing that. I'm using my HP generator which is very accurate. And I have the, uh, the thing set to a 2 microvolt sensitivity that's over here. And I'm, at presently I'm at 3 megahertz. And I'm using 1 kilohertz of AM modulation. And right now the modulation is turned off. Now, what I have done is connected a Simpson VOM to the output. It's right here. Let me crank the camera up a ways so it'll be a little easier to read. Move it around a little. And what I'm going to be showing you is the... First I'm going to turn up with the modulation off, just the carrier in the background. I'm going to turn it up until I read... that's better than uh, a 10 dB signal to noise ratio. Now if I turn the generator off and turn it up to about that same level, you see that that's with just noise, that's with carrier, that is with modulation. So, <clears throat> what I've determined, and by the way, that is at 3 megahertz. Let me swing over here and show you that on the dial. This will give, this will be unfortunately a lot of parallax, but I'll line it up here in a second and show you from straight on. Now you see with it straight on, and as you'll notice, the dial calibration, it's reading just a little bit low on 3. Let me zoom in a little better and you can see that. That's 3 megahertz. So the RF alignment could do it with a little bit of touch up, but I think what's actually going on there is the band spread. That is, the band spread moves this dial around a little bit. So what I'm going to do is see if I can get the band spread set 
spot on and then check recheck this dial accuracy. I've got the band spread set almost precisely so let's now check and see what we get here. It looks like to me that that dial is about as close as you can expect uh, for a receiver of this type. Now you never get the kind of dial accuracy on an old analog receiver that you get on a modern digital receiver where you use a phase locked loop and a high precision crystal reference and all of that. But nonetheless, it's certainly accurate enough to find stations in the international broadcast band and accurate enough in the amateur bands, I think, to, to at least uh, make sure that you're within the band edges and so on, which of course is one of the most important things when you're operating amateur radio. Now, this, like I said before, this is not an especially good amateur radio receiver. It really was intended to be a compromise that was sort of uh, a shortwave listener's receiver as well as a uh, having the ham bands with the hope that maybe they could sell to a little broader audience. The Halicrafters made a better ham only receiver than this one. So uh, let me do a little more performance testing. If I run into any anomalies I'll uh, do a little video on those. Otherwise I think I'm getting pretty close to buttoning this up. I've moved up to band number three at eight megahertz and you see there we're getting very very accurate on that band. I'm just moving the tuning control slightly here. Yeah, that's, that's close, certainly close enough for me on 8 megahertz. Uh, so let me now go up to the next band, which is band 4. Now I'm at uh, on 24 megahertz. It's a little harder for you to see the dial. Let me move the light down a little better here. And... I'm having to move the band spread to get it precisely to 24 down to about 80 on the logging scale. So it's a little bit off at 24 megahertz. The, uh, uh, in other words, I'm having to tune the oscillator away from the 20, exact 24 megahertz. Let me turn that volume off so you don't have, don't have to compete with that. Uh, stunning kilohertz signal there. Uh, I'm very happy with the performance. It looks like that uh, it has uh, performance about a microvolt or better across this entire range. Now I'm going to go up to band 5, which uh, as you may remember we have to tune over here on the band spread dial and see whether that also will give me a one microvolt uh, sensitivity. Well, finally something interesting to, uh, to work on. The, uh, it does not appear to be working in, the, uh, in this band 5. So I may have a dirty uh, band switch and that kind of thing. Uh, it's, I'm actually happy to find something to work on. This receiver has been pretty much worked. Everything I've checked has been uh, right on and uh, the alignment actually even seems to be right on. So I suspect that somebody has realigned this receiver before I bought it. I bought it about three years ago and the person that advertised it seemed to know a bit about radio so I'm going to guess that he probably realigned this himself or at least uh, Somebody did it for him because it's it's 
the alignment is spot on, except it does not seem to work in band 5. So let me see if I can figure out what's wrong there, and I'll be back with some more video. Okay, I think I've, let me get this out of the way, it's a little blurry there. Uh, okay, I think that'll work. Now let me zoom in a little here, so you can see. The problem turned out to just be a dirty band switch. And now let's see if we can tune in a 50 megahertz signal. volts at 50 megahertz. Let me turn the volume down a little on that. And you see it's very, very close. Just reading a little bit low. It seems to read just a little bit low all the way across the range. So that you could adjust that out, but frankly in a receiver of this age and uh, and this design, the it's it's as close as it probably was when it came out of the factory. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mess with the alignment at all on this receiver. Uh, I would like to at some time show a complete RF alignment on a, uh, a receiver like this. I was going to do an SX62. I did the alignment. Uh, had about I don't know 35 minutes of video on it and I was going to edit that down to hopefully 10 or 15 minutes and somehow that video disappeared if you watched my SX62 series you know that uh, I was kind of disappointed because I got it all put together and went to edit the video and I couldn't find it anywhere so anyway uh, on this receiver it's just not far enough off to justify messing with it and I think what I'm going to do now is is perhaps hook up an antenna and tune across the bands a little bit and see what I can hear. Uh, might uh, do a little video on that. Uh, but at any rate, I think I'm getting near the end, about ready to wrap this up. Well, I couldn't really find much. It's middle of the day right now and I did find a station here around 12 megahertz. It's a uh, uh, Radio Mondial. It's a Spanish language station. Not very strong. Of course that may be because my uh, my antenna is just a string of that yellow wire that you may see running up there to the top and then across. It's about 10 feet long or so. And that short antenna and the time of day means I'm not going to be getting much. I'll turn around a little bit more, but I think I'm going to have to wait till tonight to, uh, to find much. That's common with shortwave. Uh, I guess I could go down and, and listen to an AM station, so let me try that. Okay, here's a, an AM station on 1260. Advertising diamonds. Uh, so, it, the receiver seems to work fine. I could use a better antenna for, for this. I'm not sure where I'm going to put this radio. I got so many that uh, pretty much all the good places are taken. But uh, perhaps I can find a place to put this radio where I can use it from time to time. At any rate, I've enjoyed working on it. I wish there had actually been a little more to do. It was mostly just, you know, check this, move on, check this, move on. So. Uh, 
So maybe I can find something in the future. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this video on the SX-71 and uh, hope you learned something from it. I learned a bit about the receiver. I didn't know much about it. Uh, and I had some fun too. So uh, in the meantime, look out for some more videos, but I'm probably going to close out the SX-71 for now. Have a nice day.